All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I was told to approach this from a systematic point of view, and that first there'd be Old Testament, then New Testament, and then history. And the way I think about systematic theology, if I can't do Old Testament or New Testament or history, I don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> systematic theology, the way I envision it, sort of um, tends to everybody else's business because it has no proper business of its own <laughs> if it doesn't have the biblical witness or the history of the interpretation of it. But I've pulled together something systematic for you. I would call it a Trinitarian anthropology, Except if I say that, everyone's going to think, how many parts do you cut Adam up to? And is it three? And what is that? Anyway, so I'm not doing that. And then the last thing I want to say about this is uh, that I'm live tweeting this talk right now, even as I'm up here in front of you. So I didn't see a hashtag, so you'd have to follow Fred Fred Sanders on Twitter. So that's, I don't have a PowerPoint, so I made up for it by live tweeting my own talk. Okay. <laughs> Theological anthropology. Uh, the title here is Systematic Atomology in Trinitarian Perspective. Theological anthropology ought to be theological not just in the sense that it's a subsection of Christian doctrine devoted to the subject of humanity, that is, it's the particular ology that goes with the subject anthropos in the table of contents. It also ought to be theological in the more direct and immediate sense that it describes the relation of humanity to God. Its task, rightly conceived, is to give a doctrinal accounting of how the human stands with regard to God. That means that unlike any of the secular anthropologies, the field of theological anthropology must be about more than the subject of humanity. In fact, infinitely more. As a doctrine, it must make claims about the relation of humanity to God. And therefore, it must have a skylight in its conceptual ceiling, permanently open to God. This is not just a general observation about how all knowledge is interconnected. The interconnection between these two fields of knowledge is not equal, reciprocal, or reversible because the actual relations between God and humanity are not. While there could conceivably be such a thing as a true doctrine of God that did not absolutely need to mention humanity, there cannot conceivably be such a thing as a true doctrine of humanity that does not need to mention God. God is God with or, hypothetically, without humanity, but humanity is not itself without God. The relation is mixed, that is, it's constitutive in the God-to-humanity direction, but it is not constitutive in the humanity-to-God direction. God minus creation stands, but creation minus God has no standing. So theological anthropology must include a reference to God in order to be itself at all. Now this requirement is even more obviously binding when theological anthropology gets down to its business of the classical mode of reflection on Adam. We might imagine many other possible starting points besides Adam or focusing lenses for the Christian doctrine of humanity, but it's the obvious consensus of the classical traditions of Christian thought that the right way to begin in this doctrine is not with the general, but with the given particular, Adam. Adam enjoys canonical pride of place at the beginning of the book. Genealogical pride of place in the human family as traced in scripture, and categorical pride of place as the single instance of the kind human placed before us for reflection. Furthermore, as a particular person, Adam stands in an actualized relationship to God. That is why, in spite of the fact that as a character, Adam appears on about one page's worth of verses in all of Holy Scripture, nevertheless, his shadow falls across hundreds of thousands of pages of theological anthropology. We can pick him out for theological reflection, atomology, that's a word I made up. But as he is presented to us in scripture, he is embedded in a network of constitutive relations. Adam absolutely requires reference to something outside of Adam in order to account for him. He is not first of all an abstraction or a topic, but a particular man. And when we make him the subject of study, a full atomology would include much more than Adam. Atomology must have reference to the earth standing immediately beneath his dusty feet and the heavens looming remotely above his upraised head. Only on this cosmic stage, under these greater and lesser lights, can this player emerge into action. Adam is entangled. Now, anyone who's heard the story at all knows that Adamology needs Eveology in a particularly constructive way. God's creation is good, and yet it is not good for man to be alone. I'm mixing Genesis 1 and 2 there. I get that. That's a feature. That's a standard part of what I'm doing. So, like, I know I'm doing that. Um, but Adam is first. And we are also following scripture's lead when we isolate him for initial analysis. 
even though it's a feat of remarkable abstraction and conceptual concentration to single him out from the matrix of his existence. For our purposes, the advantage of doing so is that it enables us to consider the human as a single unit in relation to God. And this is worth doing. As soon as we consider humanity under the dual aspect of Adam and Eve, in his own image, male and female, he made them. Again, I'm mixing Genesis 1 and 2 there on purpose. We are dealing with a manifold relational unity and considering its integrated standing before God. But to focus on Adam is to focus on the one and only human in this primal singularity as a creature standing before God. And this is a crucial analytic task for systematic atomology because it opens the conceptual skylight towards God and starkly illuminates the entire creator-creature relationship. That is the vista that can open up before us in atomology. Genesis does not treat Adam as just another one of the creatures, but signals to us that he is a particular focusing point of creaturehood itself. Um, when I say that about Genesis in particular, I'd have to talk a little differently about Psalm 8 or about Job and their witness to the place of humanity, but really sticking to uh, the Genesis witness and what it says about man through Adam. Um, Adam's relation to God has the unique role within creation of representing creaturehood itself to the creator. This means that to understand how Adam is related to God is valuable for understanding creation itself. What is it to be a creature? Well, ask Adam. He, we could theoretically ask any creature, but only Adam is going to give us an answer. The patristic tradition could sometimes pose the question of creaturehood to some pretty strange characters, like pure unformed matter on the one hand, or the world soul on the other hand. But prime matter, being formless, isn't signifying anything. It doesn't even change. And that big thing, the world soul, if it exists at all, only ever says one thing, which is the universal everything, which is great, but not helpful. <laughs> Something in the middle can speak for the whole. Rocks, ferns, and rabbits are decent middle candidates in ascending order for articulating creaturehood. But their rocky, ferny, and rabbity answers leave us wanting more. And angelic theology is not directly available to us. So Adam is the one who shows and knows and can say with authority what it is to be a creature. To be a creature is to have your beginning and your ending in God. More than that, it is to have God as your beginning and end, as your alpha and omega, the principle of your being and the telos towards which you are directed in all things. This is true of all creatures, but the creatures with knowledge and understanding can focus that reference to their principle and end. Creatures with self-knowledge can be the part of creation that knows itself before its creator as its principle and end. Creatures with a will and a moral faculty can penetrate into the creaturehood even more deeply so that the law of their being is not just a set of natural forces operating on them, but a law that they can willingly obey, align with, and conform to. This is what gives Adam his special place in creation. He is a creature who can know and will creaturehood. Adam has the possibility of consciously rejoicing in the fact of having been personally invited into being by God. Rabbits thank God for being by being rabbits. That's an explanation of the very pious rabbits on the graphics for this conference. <laughs> um, um, so with all creatures, they thank God for their being by being what they are. But Adam can do more. To be a creature is a joyous thing, says 19th century theologian Frederick Faber. He says, even our very nothingness is dear to us as we think of God. For it seems to be almost a grandeur instead of an abasement to have been thus called out of nothing by such a one as he. So Adam needs God, and Adamology needs theology proper, the doctrine of God. Because out of all the relations in which Adam is entangled, it is his relation to God that makes him who he is. Adam is disclosed to us in relational contrast and contrasting relation to God above all. Unlike God, Adam has an origin story. We read it. He is assembled from raw materials, and he requires companionship. God, by contrast, is in the wise words of the Westminster Confession, without body, parts, or passions. Adam is not Adam without all of these. Adam has God as his beginning and end. He is from God and for God. God is his own beginning and end. God, too, is from God and for God, but as God. In its realistic way of narrating the relation between God and Adam, Scripture brings both of them before us as characters in a story. And yet, the divine character exceeds the story in which he appears. He is not simply a character within it, 
but also the condition for the possibility of the story. In other words, God, like Adam, is a character, but God is not a character like Adam. This is one of the ways Genesis uses narrative rather than metaphysical categories to signal the fact that the relation of God and Adam is not symmetrical. Adam, the creature, is just there. God, the creator, is truly present with him, but is present from an infinite depth in himself. What is it to be a creature of this God? A properly systematic atomology would be an account of Adam in the constitutive relations that make him himself. Even as we focus on him, we focus on him in relation because he is necessarily open in all these directions, towards the heavens and the earth, toward the other animals, towards Eve, towards progeny, towards God. Putting first things first, this essay in systematic atomology focuses on the skylight and the conceptual ceiling, examining the relation of Adam to God. The thesis of this atomology is that Adam's relation to God has the unique role in creation of representing creaturehood itself to the creator. One reason Adam has this unique role in creation has to do with his relation to all the other elements of creation. That's an interesting subject, but we will not explore that aspect of the doctrine of Adam here. But the other reason Adam has this unique role in creation is that he has such a complex set of relations to God. We will look at three of these, doing so with the aid of traditional Trinitarian categories, exploring Adam's relations to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We will expose these relations by taking up some traditional disputed questions, and we'll take them in reverse order, asking first, how did Adam have the Holy Spirit? Second, how was Adam's human nature like Christ's? And third, how was Adam the son of God? In each of these relations to God, we will see Adam's paradigmatic creaturehood displayed. So, number one, pneumatology. How did Adam have the Holy Spirit? The relation of the unfallen Adam to the Holy Spirit is a contested question in systematic theology. Before the fall into the state of sin and corruption, Adam existed in a state of innocence or a state of integrity. The nature of that integrity is what we're asking about when we ask about Adam's relation to the Holy Spirit. The state of integrity is also described as a state of original righteousness or original justice or a state of original blessedness. This much is fairly agreed on across the range of Christian doctrine. But a doctrinal difference appears uh, when we ask just how original that state of original righteousness was for Adam. One view is that it was entirely original and primal there at the utter beginning part and parcel with the creation of humanity. As Thomas Boston put it, when God made Adam, quote, he did not first make him and then make him righteous, but in the very making of him, he made him righteous. Original righteousness was created with him, so that in the same moment he was a man, he was a righteous man and very good, morally good. With the same breath that God breathed into him a living soul, he breathed into him a righteous soul. Here, the breath of life moving from God to Adam is considered multivalently as Adam's own force of life and as the special presence and activity of the third person of the Trinity. Adam's righteousness is concreated with him. Uh, That word autocorrects every time you try to type it. (laughs) Concreated with him, created with him, so that the two never existed apart from each other. In the state of habitual and actual righteousness, Adam conformed to the very law of his nature as communicated to him by his maker. And thus he enjoyed fellowship with God. That God made man upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29, is something that can be measured with reference to Adam's conformity to an inborn moral law. Now Thomas Boston's a Puritan and he talks like one. The legal idiom is probably not especially congenial to modern minds, carrying connotations of following rules. But the whole point for this theology of concreated righteousness is that the law was in human nature. Just as surely as the law of rabbit being is built into rabbit nature, The law of human being is built into human nature, but as a thing knowable and willable far beyond the range of rabbits. Adam's mind, will, and affections were all aligned with the good. In terms of his mind, the law was not written on tablets of stone, but written upon his mind, the knowledge thereof, says Boston, being created with him. God impressed it upon his soul and made him a law to himself. In terms of Adam's will, quote, It was disposed by its original maker to follow the creator's will as the shadow follows the body. That's the kind of obedience to law that we're talking about here, as the shadow follows the body. Adam's knowledge and will supported each other fittingly. 
quote, as Adam knew his master's pleasure in the matter of duty, so his will inclined to what he knew. And finally, in terms of Adam's unfallen affections, they were, quote, orderly, pure, and holy. This purity and good order of the affections, before the intellect and will get involved, just the affections residing there in the human, um, intimates something tangibly deeper than knowledge of the law or consent to the law, because it suggests the repose and alignment of the manifold springs of action in the human. This repose and alignment was the basis of Adam's fellowship with his creator. Boston says, quote, as troubled water is unfit to receive the image of the sun, so the heart filled with impure and disorderly affections is not fit for divine communications. In sum, this original righteousness was natural to him, not supernatural, says Boston. Boston then makes one further distinction. Not that it was essential to man as man, for then he could have not have lost it without the loss of his very being. But it was natural to him. This is the distinction between being essential and being natural. It wasn't essential to him or he couldn't have lost it, but it was natural to him. He was created with it, and it was necessary to the perfection of man as he came out of the hand of God, necessary to his being placed in a state of integrity. Yet it was mutable. It was a righteousness that might be lost, as is manifested by the doleful event. So far, Thomas Boston. That's all from Boston's work. What's that thing called? Um, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. To get a clearer view of the work of the Holy Spirit in Adam's state of integrity, we can contrast original righteousness with the fallen state. Abraham Kuyper observes that after the fall, quote, our faculties and inclinations are impaired, our powers are enervated, the passions of our hearts are corrupt, hence the Holy Spirit must come to us from without. But since Adam's faculties were all intact and the whole expression of his inward life undisturbed, therefore could the Holy Spirit work through the common powers and operations of his nature. To Adam, spiritual things were not a supernatural, but a natural good, except eternal life, which he must earn by fulfilling the law. Adam, that is, had fellowship with God naturally through the presence within him of the Holy Spirit working imminently in his own human powers in a way not available to us now. Adam may look forward to a confirmation in his righteous state that would issue an eternal life, but his righteousness was built into his very nature from the beginning. God made man upright. So far, the view of concreated original righteousness. An alternative view, identified with some scholastic Roman Catholic theology, maintains that Adam could exist in a state of integrity and not yet have righteousness, blessedness, or the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, Not yet here is best understood logically uh, as opposed to chronologically. There were some, I think some 12th century theologians, 13th century, who played around with the idea that there was actually a period of time in which Adam existed in one state before the next state was added to him, but that was pretty soundly rejected pretty early, and it doesn't really show up in the scholastic manuals. Johann Adam Muller, comparing the Roman Catholic system to the Protestant on this point, puts it this way, quote, no finite body can exist in a living moral communion with the deity, save by the communion of the Holy Spirit. This relation of Adam to God, as it exalted him above human nature and made him participate in that of God, is hence termed a supernatural gift of grace superadded to the endowments of nature. This is not merely a private opinion of theologians, says Muller, the Roman Catholic theologian from Tübingen, but a dogma. This is the view of Adam's original righteousness as a superadded gift, a donum superadditum. Its strength is that it registers quite strongly the difference between the created spirit of Adam and the uncreated person of the Holy Spirit. You may have been wondering how to tell the Holy Spirit apart from Adam's spirit while Boston was talking. Its weakness in doing so is that it risks conjuring a merely and purely natural Adam who is not yet in relation to God and who will meet the Holy Spirit as a stranger later on. The donum superadditum view, in spite of its best intentions, ends up excluding from its atomology an adequate reference to the creator's presence to the creature as such. The best way forward for a systematic atomology is to maintain that Adam's original righteousness is concreated with him that Adam is in fellowship with God by the Holy Spirit working in his creaturely faculties, and then go on to distinguish carefully the differences between this interior reality of the Holy Spirit in Adam's spirit on the one hand, and something like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in fallen but regenerate believers on the other hand. So, point two, Christology. How was Adam's human nature like Christ's? Atomology is greatly enriched, though somewhat indirectly, by reflection on the constitution of the human nature of the incarnate Son. When the eternal Son takes to himself 
a uniquely God-centered human nature, he casts light on the constitution of Adam. We'll need to establish the incarnational theology of Christ's human nature briefly first before investigating its implications for Adamology. Now, if the eternal person who is the Son took to himself a perfect and complete human nature, what is the status of that human nature which he assumed? Normally, any instance of human nature that we come into contact with is also a human person. Is the human nature of Christ, therefore, also a human person? The Christology we're considering here gives a twofold answer. On the one hand, the human nature of Jesus Christ is, in fact, a nature joined to a person, and it is therefore personal. To use the Greek term, it is en hypostatic, E-N hypostatic. But the person who personalizes the human nature of Christ is not a created human person, like all other persons personalizing other human natures we encounter. Rather, it, that is, he, is the eternal second person of the Trinity. So the human nature of Christ is personal, but it's personal with a personhood from above. Considered in itself, on the other hand, and abstracted from its personalizing by the eternal person of the Son, the human nature of Jesus Christ is simply human nature and is not personal. It's not somebody without the somebody who it is. The human nature of Christ, therefore, is an hypostatic with the uh, alpha privative on there, not personal in itself, and an hypostatic, personalized by union with the eternal person of the Son. One obvious strength of an hypostatic and hypo, an man, I knew that would be hard. One obvious strength of the an hypostatic and hypostatic Christology is that it banishes forever the old tendency to find two somebodies inside of Jesus. Because we know that Jesus is fully God and fully human, we often fall prey to the unintentionally Nestorian error of finding in the incarnation, alongside the human person, the second person of the Trinity undergoing human experiences, another person who is simply the human Jesus. This shadowy, non-existent figure lurks at the back of much modern Christology. He's a man descended from David and born to Mary, who somehow had to get out of the way when the eternal Son of God took over his personal existence. Having never existed, this character is stubbornly hard to eliminate from the conceptual fringes of Christology. That's why we need the Chalcedonian categories and the full post-Chalcedonian package of an hypostatic Christology. This person, who I've nicknamed Adam Davidson, <laughs> is the person Jesus would have grown up to be if he hadn't been the Son of God. No such person ever existed or ever could because the human nature of Jesus Christ was nobody until the eternal Logos took it on as his own, personalizing or impersoning it or enhupostatizing it and making it a real man. Otherwise, God owes Mary a baby because somebody took hers, the, the Adam Davidson that that would have been. Jesus Christ is human and Jesus Christ is a person. It is also true that Jesus Christ is a human person, but only, we have to be clear that a human person cannot mean something like his created human nature is personalized by a created human personhood. That is not the case. Instead, we can and must think that Jesus is a human person because the human nature of this divine person, the humanity of the hypostasis of the Son, is somebody, a human somebody. Sometimes the anhupostatic, anhupostatic Christology is objected to on the grounds that it seems Christ fails to be human in the same way Adam was human. But if we're convinced of its rightness, we can move the other direction and ask what this Christology entails for Adamology. A minor implication of this, a minor implication for Adamology, probably merely terminological, is whether we can rightly speak of Adam as incarnate in human nature, or whether his necessarily created personhood is so concreated with his human nature that it reveals the impropriety of using incarnational language, except anywhere in the incarnation, in the instance of the assumption of human nature by a pre-existent divine person. Only the truly pre-existent or pre-incarnate can meaningfully be called incarnate. The rest of us are just carnate. <laughs> so I might be nitpicking there, but anyway. The major question open here is whether the human nature of Christ so uniquely centered on God that it is not itself without the person of the Son personalizing it, is best regarded as an exception to the human rule or as the paradigm case of true humanity. Can we take the humanity of Christ as the ultimate instance of what humanity can be in this singular, unrepeatable human case of perfect God-centeredness? There are strengths and weaknesses, trade-offs, whichever way we go on this question. But it seems to me that as long as we mark the infinite difference between the uncreated person who is the Son of God and the created person who is Adam, 
There's the creator-creature distinction playing a constitutive role again for us. As long as we mark that, we can say something important about how the former is the pattern for the latter. Adam required God in order to be himself. The secret of his creaturehood was his need for God. The structural openness or receptivity toward God that made him fully human. This openness or necessary Godwardness of the creature characterized his entire person and nature, both of which were created ex nihilo. In the case of Christ, uh, well, I guess technically his nature was the body of his nature was made out of the dust of the earth. It's, a, it's ex, is there a fancy word for out of dust? Ex dustio? I don't know. <laughs> ex vetera? Anyway. Um, uh, the Godwardness of the Son is the Godwardness of the Logos, who was God and also with God, prostantheon, toward God, Godward. Neither Adam nor any of his descendants are destined to grow into that eternal hypostasis. That uncreated hypostasis is not something into which you grow. It is God. It is the incommunicable way of being God that is the Son. But the purpose and destiny of redeemed humanity is to become conformed to the image of the Son. So in a sense, the perfect God-centeredness of the incarnate Son can be a model or a paradigm of human perfection. Adam, after all, was most Adam when he was most Godward. Third point, the doctrine of the Father, which has no name, but I have proven myself shameless in making up names, so patrology. How was Adam the son of God? When we examined Adamic Uh, pneumatology, we mostly followed a conversation from the 16th and 17th centuries. Turning to Christological categories, we looked at the 4th and 5th centuries. For the doctrine of God the Father, which has no agreed upon name, but which I'm calling patrology, we moved to the 18th and 19th centuries. At some point after 1798, a new theological temper came upon the world, and it came to seem self-evident that God was the universal father of all. I don't know why 1798, Wordsworth and Coleridge published lyrical ballads, Schleiermacher's working on the Christian faith, or not the Christian faith, the uh, speeches on religion. Something big is in the air in 1798. Um, It's a curious development. Even the leading champions of the doctrine of the universal fatherhood of God acknowledged that it was a fairly new development. John Scott Lidgett, the great Methodist theologian, writing around 1910, claimed both that it was the burning heart of the distinctively New Testament concept of God and that it had not been clearly understood until the Victorian period. He just directly says that. The new orthodoxy of the universal fatherhood of God drew its most articulate reaction and rejection in the person of Robert Candlish, whose book on the subject insisted that the term father was properly a matter of the eternal relation of the first and second persons of the Trinity, and then a matter of the inclusion of believers in that relation by the divine action of the incarnation and the miracle of union with Christ. It was not, in other words, an appropriate category to use when speaking of mere creation. It was in the Bible and traditional theology a salvation word. Candlish complains of the new view of things. He says, It has somehow come to be taken for granted in many quarters that the primary and original relation of God to man is the paternal one, and that consequently any other relations which may belong to him and in fact, all his ordinances and actings and all his dealings with the human race as a whole and with all of its members individually, must be be viewed as springing out of that first and fundamental relation, paternity, and molded and regulated by it. That's the end of the quote. Um, Candlish was eager to agree that God behaves kindly, gently, lovingly, and in that sense, paternally, toward all of his creatures as such. He simply insisted that to call this behavior fatherly was to indulge in metaphorical speech, and that this kind of metaphorical speech, while permissible in itself and even findable in scripture at the margins, runs afoul of orthodoxy when it begins to displace the real, actual, relational fatherhood of which the New Testament speaks. It is not a question, he says, Candlish is Scottish, but I am not going to do the accent. It is not a question, he says, about the existence of a certain attribute of God, such as goodness, kindness, pity, sympathy, Nor is it a question about the sentiments and feelings which God may be supposed to entertain towards the beings whom he has made and which he may express or embody in his dealings with them. The question is much more precise and definite. The question for Candlish is whether every creature is by necessity a son, or to put it the other way, whether God necessarily stands as father to every creature he creates. If this is so, insisted Candlish, then the very category of creature is evacuated. 
The same problem ensues even if we reserve the term fatherhood for God's relation to humans alone, perhaps on the argument that a creature made in the image of God must be, by definition, a child of God. That same loss of creatureliness sets in for the human when a category of redemption is illegitimately read back into the definition of creation. Kendler says it deranges and disturbs the whole great economy of creation. What we lose when we substitute fatherhood for creatorhood without remainder is the actual status of Adam before God. God is his maker, his ruler, his sovereign, his judge, his lord, his master. Let me pause here and say, none of these terms are really politically correct, but this Victorian move to identify fatherhood with fatherliness also is decimated by the feminist critique of Christian God language. If, if the meaning of father is that you know what fatherliness is and God acts that way, then you're really in projection mode and you really are excluding the feminine by talking about God as father. So that's kind of a very telescoped summary of the feminist critique, but um, notice that it doesn't apply in the same way to an actual doctrine of the imminent trinity in which the mutually constitutive father-son relation is something going on in the being of God. There we're not projecting at all. We're disciplining our language to say back to God what his language is. The Victorian project really embraced the, all the social implications of fatherhood. And so it, uh, you don't hear it said the same way anymore. Um, it's ruler and sovereign. The notion of the creator's government of the very highest of his intelligent creatures, Candlish says, the notion of this being anything else in its principle and ideal than simply and strictly legal and judicial as it respects the radical and essential relation of creator and creature, is an inconsistency, an intolerable anomaly, and a suicidal self-contradiction. So, Candlish saw the new teaching on the universal fatherhood of God as swallowing up the category of God as a ruler. Adam as son, if we take it with full seriousness, can no longer be analyzed as Adam the creature. He is already more than creature. Candlish wanted to ensure that both categories were fully functioning for a robust theology. He says, I contend earnestly for the distinction of the two relations. Neither must be suffered to override the other. Neither must be merged or sunk in the other. It's one thing for me to have God as my ruler, lawgiver, and judge. It is another and altogether different thing for me to have him as my father. Well, the argument over universal divine fatherhood raged in the 19th century and is more or less still at work among us. In my opinion, Candlish won the debate but lost the world. Champions of the universal fatherhood of God had the spirit of the age with them. The wind was in their cells. The plausibility structures of the intellectual culture at large were in their favor, very much on their side. They also had powerful theologians like John Scott Lidgett reframing the entirety of Christian doctrine around the notion of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And not just in the neighborhood of Boston, this guy was British. This is an international shift of temperament. The historical case is ripe for re-examination, and Lidgett in particular is just a genius. I wrote him into the paper because I wanted to just, just kneecap him and destroy him right in your presence, but he's just a really great thinker. Uh, I mean, he's wrong, but he's just a fantastic thinker. Um, what can be said systematically about the right use of the term father with regard to God's relation to Adam? Obviously, Adam is the son of God in some sense. The genealogy of Luke 4 traces the line of sonship right back up to God. And yet Genesis, which could easily have used son language, simply refuses to. To get atomology right, we need to have a taxonomy of different meanings of the biblical term father. So in ascending order, starting from the lowest, number one, if God produces anything, he stands in a metaphorical relationship of father to it. We are all his offspring. There's a warm and cozy word, offspring. He gave birth to the frost and the snow. The angels are sons of God, etc. God as the source is the genitor of all creatures. And you could translate genitor father, though you might want to translate it baby daddy. Uh, he is their producer or source. Um, number two, Adam is in some special sense a son of God as the creature bearing God's image. So there is something special about Adam's relation to God because he is in God's image. That picks him out. Number three, Israel is in a more special sense the son of God. Um, his firstborn, because God has elected Israel and made them his people by redemption. Number four, Christians are in a more particular sense the sons of God, because adoption in Christ relates them to God the Father in particular. Only here do we have a reference to God which picks out the first person of the Trinity rather than the entire, rather than the entire Godhead as creator. It seems to me the New Testament usage is decisive here. As H.C.G. Mull said, 
It is plain that in scriptures, the words father, son, child, etc., in this connection, tend habitually to refer not to nature, but to grace. Not to creation, but to redemption, and especially to adoption and regeneration. Not to Adam, but to Christ. Not to the world, but to the church. Number five, Jesus is in a more particular sense the Son of God. Footnote here, the Gospels. Pass him. Number six, the second person of the Trinity considered as such is the true and essential Son of God, without whom God would not be Father in any real sense. Fatherhood finally points to this relation within the life of God, in which the Son is eternally generated from the Father. Now, having reached the top of the scale, and it was a hard six-step climb, we can work back down it, which is the fun part. Father means something within the life of the Trinity originally. That something is extended by grace to those who are in Christ by participation in the human sonship of the incarnate one. It is metaphorically extendable to all creatures because God is their source, origin, and genitor. It has a special purchase on intelligent moral creatures because a a tender fatherliness characterizes God's care for them. Psalm 103, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord hath mercy on them that fear him. I don't know why that's in King James, but it is. But it does not have the kind of referential power that could pick out the first person of the Trinity. To put it very strongly, God as father, God as father of Adam is, wait a minute, I said I put it strongly, but I put it confusingly. Oh yeah, God as father of Adam is God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Adam, we might say, does not have God the Father as his father, but God the Trinity as his father. He has the one God behaving fatherly toward him. But there's nothing in the creator-creature relation itself, as such, that could penetrate the inseparable divine action of the triune God and refer meaningfully to the first person of the Trinity. That kind of insight, the ability to pick out a particular person of the Trinity relationally, is an inside job. By contrast, believers go from having God as their genitor, who can be thought of as fatherly, to having God, the father of the eternal son, be their father by adoption. One author puts it this way. We must recognize that whilst the Bible teaches the fatherhood of God, it's not always with exactly the same meaning. He goes on. There is a scriptural sense in which God is described as the father of the human race. They are his offspring, and their first ancestor was his son. But on the other hand, All men are not his sons in the more personal sense. And then he strikes this balance. The preaching of the gospel suffers if the doctrine of the fatherhood of God is not rightly understood. If all men without distinction are thought of as being personally sons of God, the necessity for the new birth disappears, and a kind of universalism takes its place. But if the prodigal son can, this is on the other hand, but if the prodigal son can no longer be sure that God has the feelings of a father for him, the gospel we preach will seem very hard and legal. Let us take care, therefore, to recognize the perfect balance of Scripture in this matter. That seems exactly right to me, evangelically speaking. The good news of salvation by adoption comes to sinful creatures whose deepest grief is that they have left the Father's house and need to return from their wanderings to their true home. Speaking in a more dogmatic register, keeping a sharp eye on how these terms get their meanings, I think it is crucial to maintain good order keep first things first, and know what we are doing when we let ourselves speak of God as the father of Adam. We are metaphorically recognizing the, creature's fa- the creator's fatherly care. We are not letting Adam into the father-son relationship, which is the heart of New Testament soteriology. So, conclusion. We already knew certain things about Adam's creaturely relations to God before we undertook a Trinitarian examination of those relations. We knew that he stood before God not just as a private citizen, but as a public person, so to speak, representing not only the human race, but creaturehood. We knew that he was a deep, a kind of dynamic exemplar of the meaning of being, to use the idiom of Ferdinand Ulrich's evocative book, Homo Abyssus. Adam is not just anybody. That's the bumper sticker version. He's special, we might say, but he's special by being especially creaturely. Already knowing this, When we went on to examine him in greater detail in his relations to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we were able to see some of the complexity of these relations. In particular, by asking whether Adam had the Holy Spirit, whether his constitution was clarified by comparison with the human nature of the incarnate Son, and in what way God was his Father, we were able to locate Adam at the right distance from God, so to speak. Not too close, not too far. 
In each of the three cases, there were magnetic attractions that tempted us to locate Adam too close to God. By filling him with the spirit of Pentecost, by treating him as an incarnate person in human nature, or by making him the son of God by participation in the eternal son's relation to the father. In each case, it was the very specificity of the respective Trinitarian categories that warned us off of these overestimations of the status of creatures. But in each case, there was also a temptation to locate Adam too far from God, as it were, to deny that he had any interaction with the Holy Spirit, to think of the incarnate son's constitution as an exception or even a violation of the law of human nature, or to withhold even the metaphorical sense of fatherhood from his relation to the fatherly God, making him some kind of cosmic orphan. In each case, the Trinitarian categories didn't merely reinforce what we already knew, but gave us conceptual tools to calibrate our understanding more precisely and to check our work. Creature can be a blunt word, but the relation of the creature to God can seem like a vast, and the relation of the creature to God can seem like a vast featureless abstraction. The relation of the Trinity to Adam is, as we have seen, a more fine-grained affair, but it takes us to the heart of that larger issue the relation of the creature to the creator. So with this more detailed account of the creator-creature relation in place, we can say three things about Adam. First, he needs his fellow creatures. When we abstracted him from Eve and the land animals and the heavens and the earth, we did so only for analytic clarity. Adam, in reality, is enmeshed and entangled in a network of constitutive relations in which he flourishes. In this need of others, Adam discloses something about the nature of creatureliness. There is not just one creature, but many. Wolfhart Pottenberg even presses the case, based on his philosophical analysis of the infinite, that creation is necessarily manifold. Here's Pottenberg, but again, I won't do the German accent. Pottenberg says, the creation of a reality that is distinct from God, but one that God also affirms and thus allows to share in fellowship with himself, is conceivable only as the bringing forth of a world of creatures. A single creature would be too tiny face to face with God's infinity. That's what it says, too tiny. As a finite creature, it would have no lasting entity. A finite being is limited by other beings, not merely by what is infinite, but also by other finite things. It has its distinctiveness only vis-a-vis other finite things. Only in this distinction does it exist. Hence, the finite exists as a plurality of what is finite. We creatures apparently need to stick together. Second, Adam really needs God. He needs God so much that it's tempting to call Adam incomplete without God or to build into Adam some section of his constitution that simply is the divine presence. This is a very difficult element of theological anthropology to state correctly. What we need is an idea of humanity as being constituted with a structural openness toward God that entirely rules out independence but does not undercut creaturely integrity. In some recent work, Krista McCurland has argued that human nature should be considered as being in the situation of, quote, need without lack. Need without lack, by which she means that humans are constituted with a fundamental need for God that continues to define them even when the need is supplied. Just as we need nutrition even when we are supplied with it, and not just when we feel hungry, the human needs God even when God is personally present and available. This is especially clarifying with reference to Adam, I think, because in the unfallen state, he had constant access to God undiminished by sin, and yet Adam was constituted by his need for God. Third, precisely in this solidarity with other creatures and neediness toward God, Adam the creature shows the right relation to God. Given life by the Holy Spirit, personalized by a created personhood that leans Godward in anticipation of the utter essential Godwardness of the eternal Son, and having God as both the source of his being and the sovereign ruler who exercises fatherly provision and care for him, Adam discloses creatureliness itself. Frederick Faber says that, quote, to love our creator as our first cause, as our last end, and as our abiding possession, that is the whole matter. And with the help of Trinitarian categories, we see that whole matter in Adam, the creature of the Trinity. Thank you.